Well, good morning again. Uh, we are glad that you're here today. We started a series last week um, called I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. And, um, you know, as we, as we start this series, we recognize that this is a common denominator of humankind. And, and it, you don't have to look around very long to see it, do you? I mean, you, you see this in people that you know. It's easier to spot in others, isn't it? It's easier to spot this sense of, uh, of a missing satisfaction, this sense of something that's not quite right that you're, that you're longing for, that you haven't found. It's why you two wrote a great song um, about it called I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. It, it's, it's the common denominator of humankind. It's what, it, it's what the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes. In the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible tells us this. It says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. You know what that means? That means there's something in us that longs for something more. That, that's why people will strap a bomb to their chest and, and go somewhere and, and blow something up, including themselves, because there's something in them that longs for something more. And, and they hold this promise, a false promise, but they hold this promise of something on the other side. And, and you can see this expressed in human beings. Uh, I remember, now this is going to, some of you weren't even alive at this time, but um, any of you remember back when the Cowboys were good? Anybody, anybody remember that? Some of you remember that? Like, like I, I remember in the early 90s, in the early 90s, the Cowboys kind of had gone through their stage, and, and they were back to, you know, they were back to being good. And, and so I can remember watching the first Super Bowl that they won kind of in the modern era, you know, not, not Roger Staubach and all those guys. I can remember those a little bit, sadly. But um, this is in the, you know, kind of the modern era, the 90s, and they had their new their new brigade in, and it was, you know, Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin and Jimmy Johnson and, and Jerry Jones. Hold the applause. Um, you know, so uh, it, they're, they're in, and, and I remember watching this. I was a huge Cowboy fan. I mean, I was, I, I was a huge, I've, I've lost a little of my fervor of late, but I used to be a huge Cowboy fan. In fact, I was engaged at the time, and I made my fiance, now my wife, which is ama- amazing that she you know, continued down this path because I made her memorize the Dallas Cowboys draft choices before I gave her her Christmas presents. And so that's sad, isn't it? And so how many of you would have said, okay, that's it. That's, there's, this thing's over. Yeah. So anyway, I was a huge fan. I remember watching the, the Cowboys win the Super Bowl and it was, you know, I mean, it was amazing for somebody that was a lifelong Cowboys fan and they go and they play this great game. And, and, and you know, this, is, this right here is the pinnacle, right? I mean, you, you get this, guys, right? You get this, that this is what, maybe a few girls in the room understand this too, but um, guys, you understand it. Like, this was what they had dreamed about their whole life. This is what these guys, I mean, they had grown up playing football. They had been thinking about, most of them, you know, at least since high school, you know, what it would be like to win a Super Bowl. It's like the biggest stage, the biggest game of your career. It's what you've been thinking about. They, they go out and they win this game, and I, I will never forget the interviews afterwards. When they walk up to these guys and they put the microphone in front of them and they, you know, they talk about what, what do you feel and how does this feel? And they, they would say, oh, this is awesome. This is so great. And then several of them said the same things that I think express something so important to us today. They, they would say something along these lines. They would say, and we're going to be right back here next year. Or they would say, and th- this is just the first of many. And, and, and I watched that and it, and it just became so clear to me that what, what they were expressing, and they didn't, have, you know, they didn't think of it this way, I know, but what, what was coming out of their mouths, which was expressing what they were feeling in their hearts, is, I'm still not satisfied. There, there's something else out there. This didn't do it. I, I thought it would. I mean, this is like the pinnacle of my career. This is what I'd hoped for and dreamed for. And, and now, maybe next year, though, we'll be back, and there'll be something in me that's, that's quenched. And most of you know, or know of, you probably don't know him personally. Most of you probably don't know him personally. Anybody know Robin Williams? You know, the guy that died not very long ago? You know of him, though, right? You know of Robin Williams? And Robin Williams was this, I mean, was a, was a great comedian. And, and so he, he had these goals in his life. He set out to be a great comedian, and he made a career as a great comedian. And so he accomplished that, and then he wanted to have his own TV show, and he does that. It wasn't a very good TV show, but he had his own TV show. And so he does that, and he wants to, to win an Academy Award for a non-comedic role. That was one of his goals, and he, and he accomplishes that. And he has money, and he has fame, and he has a family. And, and you know what he does? He takes his own life. 
Because there was something still missing deep down inside. Because the common denominator of humanity is that we long for something more, that we know there's something missing in our lives. And, and so today, we're going to talk about this. And we, we started this last week, and we, we talked about this lady. Jesus had this interaction for her, and you all looked at it. It's in John chapter 4. It's like uh, verses 4 through 24. Let me just kind of give you a recap. Jesus runs into this woman at the well, and um, she came to the well in the middle of the day. That's when Jesus met her, which, was, which tells us something's a little off there. I mean, if you know the history, you don't, don't, just don't put it up right now. Let me just kind of recap it. Um, if you, know, if you know kind of how society worked in that day, you understand that people went to the well in the early morning or in the late evenings when it was cool. They didn't go in the middle of the day because it was hot there. And so it kind of clues us into a truth about this lady, that she was trying to avoid people. And, and we don't know why at first. We don't, don't really understand what was going on, but, but we know she was trying to avoid people. And so Jesus has this interaction with her, and they, they talk for a little bit. And, and, and in the conversation, um, Jesus tells her about water, and, and he kind of uses the, you know, where they were, the locale there, to, to point her to a truth that, hey, this water here isn't going to really satisfy you. You're going to take a drink of this water, and you're going to get thirsty again, right? We can all agree that you, 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 know, you don't take a drink of water for a lifetime. You take a drink of water, and you're thirsty a little while later. And so Jesus is pointing that out. You know, he's saying, hey, just like you're going to, if you get this water here, you're going to be thirsty again. And he says, but if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink of water, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. That's just a beautiful picture of what it means to be satisfied, isn't it? And then he goes on and, and, he, and he, um, he says to her, he says, now, why don't you go and get your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. And he goes, yeah, that's true. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. And, and so, you know, maybe we're kind of clued in a little bit as, to, as far as why she was coming in the middle of the day. Because she was ashamed and because she didn't want to interact with people. She didn't want to go there when it was crowded. And she kind of changes the subject a little bit and talks about the mountains, and we don't have time to review it a lot. If you missed it, you can, you can watch the video from last week and just see um, how Jesus uses this idea of the mountains to explain the gospel. And, and then we, can, we get to verse 25, and that's where I want us to pick up the story because this second part of the interaction is our focus today. So if you have your Bible, John chapter 4, starting in verse 25, it says, And the woman said to him, I know, this, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town. And said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they were out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to him, or to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. And so there's this interaction here. And it, and it tells us a lot. And I think, you know, we're going to see some things about this woman because it's really interesting. I think she suffers from a common um, disease that you and I suffer for as well. Anybody here ever think, think that someday it's going to get good? Anybody ever have that thought? Hey, someday things are going to get good. I remember when I, I first graduated college, I went to Baylor University Graduated from Baylor University. No, no comments need to be made here. Graduated from Baylor University. I get my first job as a college graduate. 
And I was working at this little church. It was, it was a part-time job, but I worked full-time as a youth pastor at this church. A college graduate from a great university that charges you ridiculous prices to go to school there. And I get my first job, and I'm making $12,000 a year. I'm married. I'm married, supporting a wife here. She's in school. That's our, that's our income, making $12,000 a year. And I, I would go, and I would drive a school bus in the morning, and I would go back in the afternoon and drive a school bus, and then go back to the church and work some more. And, and I, but I remember thinking, man, one day, someday, you know, we're going to have some money. Someday, $12,000 isn't going to be what we live on. And, and so then my wife graduates, and she gets a job as a school teacher and a coach in the Waco area. They didn't pay very well. In fact, her full-time job as a college graduate from a great university, her full-time job, she, you know, she started, she was making $19,000 a year. And we thought we were rich. I mean, we, we went and we bought a new car, no lie. Like, man, we are loaded now. You know, and that lasted about three months. And then we, then we started thinking again, hey, someday we're going to have more money. Someday financially things are going to be better. I bet some of you have thought that. And it's not really just finances that this someday mentality applies, is it? I mean, many of us live our lives with the someday mentality. We're on a, this search for happiness and fulfillment and, and uh, acceptance and significance and success. And when we get to this place that we thought would provide all of that, and we recognize that it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill us, that we don't find what we're looking for, we have this coping mechanism that we think, well, someday, some, someday it'll happen. So, someday I'll discover it. And, and so we adopt this someday mentality that I'll, I'll live happily, you know, someday I'll live happily ever after. Someday, some, some day in the distance, some elusive day will come, and then we'll have our Disney moment, you know, where the Little Mermaid song plays in the background. We think there's, there's going to be a day someday. Someday, I'm going to lose the weight. Someday, I'm going to get married. Someday, I'm going to have my dream house. Someday, I'm going to have that corner office. Uh, someday, we're going to have kids. Someday we're going to get rid of our kids. <laughs> you know, some, someday everything's going to be right. Someday. Someday our marriage is going to be fixed. Someday I'm going to have a, a good relationship with my, my teenager. Someday everything's going to be great. And, and the problem with the someday mentality is that it completely minimizes and belittles today. I mean, today is just today, right? Now, now is just now. That's what's wrong with right now. Right now is just now. Someday is sexy. I mean, someday is sensational. Have you ever noticed that everything is perfect in your someday? I mean, your, your someday house, the, the grass mows itself. There's no water bill in the someday house, right? I mean, your, your someday relationship, oh, it's going to be awesome. You, you remember when you were dating and, and you thought, man... If we could just get married, everything will be perfect. Why are y'all laughing? It's the, that's the married people laughing, single people. I mean, remember when you thought, man, if we could just get married, we're going to wake up every day and we're just going to feel so loving towards one another. We're going we're gonna to wake up and just stare at each other. We're going to lay on the pillow and just stare and gaze into each other's eyes. We're going to both have good breath. And we're, we, we, we're, we're going to have a hard time. I mean, we're not going to want to go to work because we're just going to want to sit there and lay there and stare at each other. I mean, th that's how we think, right? That, that someday everything is going to be awesome someday. But now is just now. And this lady, the lady that we're looking at, this, this lady in this ancient story, she has a bad case of the somedays. I don't know if you caught it. I mean, listen, listen to the words of Jesus. So, and so we get to this part, and it says to him, you know, Jesus, you know, tells her this stuff about God is spirit in verse 24, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. You can just put someday in there, can't you? I know that the Messiah is coming someday, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Isn't that awesome? 
I mean, that, that's how we think about someday, isn't it? When someday happens, it's going to be great. And, and she's got a case of the someday's, and she says, I know that, that you know, Jesus is telling her this thing about worshipers, and they'll worship in spirit and truth. And she's like, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know about all that, but I know the Messiah is coming someday. And when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. That's how we think of someday, isn't it? Like, no, he won't. He never promised that. He never promised he was going to tell us all things. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that God hasn't told us, right? I mean, there, there are a lot of things that we still don't know. No, he won't. But it's this sensational, sexy someday. When someday comes, everything's going to be all right. I mean, the, the, the Cowboys are going to win a Super Bowl someday. We're going to have a presidential candidate that we like someday. And just anybody else will be fine. <laughs> Guy that fixes my tacos at Oscar Delta, we'll take him. <laughs> my kids won't aggravate each other someday. I mean, that, that's what this lady says. Hey, someday the Messiah is going to come and he's going to tell us everything. It's going to be great. And look at Jesus' response. I love it. Jesus, he says this to her. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus just said, hey, listen. No, wait, listen. You're missing it. You're, you're, you're still not picking up what I'm throwing down here. They, I, I've been talking to you about this, and, and I, you know, I've been, been talking to you about worship, and I've been trying to make sure that you, you caught on here, but you're still not getting it. So let me just see how clear I can make this. I who speak to you am he. And something happens in this woman here. There, there's something amazing that goes on in this story. Something changes her internally, and she doesn't speak it, so we don't, we're, we're not privy to exactly what goes on, but, but look at it. Something changes in her. What changed her? Because it says then that the, you know, the disciples come back, and, and you know, this, so these 12 Jewish guys come back, and she wasn't comfortable with one man, much less 12 Jewish men. And so she takes off. She just leaves her jar there and goes back into town. And, and something changes in her. Because she runs into town. And she starts saying, hey, I think he's the one, the Christ, the Messiah. Come on. Yo, come on. What changed her? Jesus just said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you're looking for. I, I'm what you're looking for. And it was like, bam! Something went off in her soul. And she recognized, hey, this is what I've been searching for. And she was searching, right? She'd had five husbands. Had another man now, didn't really know that she wanted to get married to him. She had tried that before. She was longing for love and acceptance. When Jesus said, I'm he, and she runs into town, and look at, look at what her testimony was. Did you see her testimony? She says this. She says, come and, and, and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Isn't that awesome? But it, I don't think he did. I mean, I mean, how long do you think this interaction was with this, this woman while the disciples went into town? I mean, what was it? Maybe, you know, probably an hour, maybe two hours. I'll give you two hours. And she's saying, hey, come and see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Ma'am, that would take a while. I mean, that, that would take some time. She had quite a, a history. She had quite a past. There's not enough time to tell you everything you've ever done. In this hour or two-hour encounter with God, he didn't tell you everything you'd ever done. I think she was trying to express, she was trying to put words around something that had gone on in her heart. And it's, it's what happens when you encounter God. Yeah, and she was trying to put words around something that, that had taken place in her heart because what, what she was saying is, it, no, it, it, she didn't mean it literally that he had told her everything she had ever done. What she meant is he told me enough to know that he knew everything that I'd ever done. 
You ever been around somebody and, and, and there was like some kind of awkward situation and you were wondering if they knew? Like it doesn't have to be anything really, I'm, I'm not talking about really skin, you know, simple and scandalous necessarily. It could be that, but it could be you know, a lot more innocent than that. But, but there's some kind of awkward situation that you're going, I wonder if they know. And you're trying to figure out if they know. And you're like, I, I don't know if they know or if they know that I know that they know. You know, you ever, in, in some, sometimes I'm in the situation on the other side where I know something, and, but I know that they don't know that I know, and I try to drop like really subtle hints where they're wondering. It makes them wonder more, does he know? And so Jesus is in this conversation with this woman, and she, he tells her enough to where she knows that he knows everything. You know, that's what happens when you encounter God. You recognize he knows everything. There's nothing about me that he doesn't know. I don't, I don't have any secrets before God. It's a scary proposition, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a scary situation for this woman. She goes to the well to avoid people, to avoid contact with people, probably because she's ashamed of her life. And she runs into contact with God. She encounters God and discovers that he knows everything there is to know about her. And can you just imagine? Do you know the second thing that happens when you encounter God? And you recognize that he knows everything there is to know, but that he loves you still. That in the midst of this conversation, she recognized not only does he, love, he know everything there is to know about me, but he's still talking to me. We're, we're still having a conversation. There's, there's compassion in his eyes. And so she goes into town, and she begins talking about this, and, and somehow she gathers a crowd, which is kind of amazing in itself, right? Because you don't get the feeling that she was a woman who had a lot of influence with the people. She probably was an elected mayor. I mean, she was probably the type of person that people ignored a lot. But something was changing her. My guess, it was the burning passion in her eyes that said, hey, you got to come meet this guy. I think he's the one. Meantime, something else is going on. The disciples get back. And they, they come back to Jesus, and they, they brought him some food. They had gone to the Chick-fil-A in town, and, um, you know, just, that was a joke. Just kidding. And they, they brought him the, you know, the Chick-fil-A, and they bring, they bring him food, and they said, hey, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus says something that confuses them. I mean, I mean it's, it, it's really confusing. He looks at them, and he says, I have food that you know nothing of. I mean, that would confuse me. Wouldn't it confuse you? And I love this about the disciples. You know what I love about the disciples? They're stupid. <laughs> that, may, that shouldn't make us all feel better, is it? shouldn't it? I mean, these were the guys closest to Jesus, and they don't have a clue. I mean, they're, they're just dumb. They, like, start arguing with each other. Who brought him food? Who brought him food? Did, he, did you bring him food? Who brought him food? Was it that woman? Did she bring him food? And they start arguing with each other, and then Jesus says, he tells them. He says, no. And in this, listen, he gives us a key to satisfaction. He gives us a key to finding satisfaction on this planet. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Now, now I mean, th think about this. He, he's talking to them about fulfillment. He's, he's unveiling his countercultural way of living. Jesus was hungry. It wasn't like he tricked them or like a charade. It wasn't like he said, hey, you guys go in and get food. And then he was like over here, I don't know, I'm not even hungry. I don't even want food. Chick-fil-A's closed. It's Sunday. There. I mean, he's not, that's not what he's doing. It's not like a joke. He was really hungry. He wanted food. But in the midst of this, even though he had this desire and this want, and food is really more than that, right? Food is a need. You need it to survive. Even in the midst of this desire, this want, this need for food, Jesus puts all that aside. And he, and, and he has this engagement, this encounter with this woman. 
And he teaches us something about satisfaction here, that satisfaction is about two things. Now, now this, is, this gets so tricky because remember earlier we talked about it's a common denominator of humanity that we're searching for something to satisfy us? But, but here's the problem. So many times people talk about this. People even teach this. They'll say, yeah, but you've got to find your individual path to satisfaction. And what I'm telling you today is that's not true. There, it's a common denominator that we long to be satisfied, and there's a common thing that satisfies us all. And Jesus taught it here. It's a two-sided coin. It's, it's to know God, and it's to bring other people to him. It's to know God. And satisfaction is found in two parts. It's found in knowing God and inviting others to do the same. And I would just... I would just encourage you, don't be duped by the thoughts and the reasoning of this culture that tells us that satisfaction is found in selfishness. So the truth is, it's, it's the opposite. And Jesus demonstrated that the pathway to satisfaction is actually found on the pathway to selflessness. It's one of the paradoxes that the Bible teaches us. Hey, you want to you wanna be filled yourself? Then give yourself away. Then serve other people. Then, then introduce other people to Christ. Then, then live for other people. I mean, listen, I, I'm, I'm 45 years old. For 45 years now, I know that surprises most of you. Most of you are thinking, he could not be a day over 30. But it, it's true, I'm 45 years old. And did you know, for 45 years... I've never met anyone. I've never met a single person that, that says, man, I've just spent too much time focused on others. Maybe that person exists, but have you ever met that person that just says, hey, oh, man, I just, I just live my life too intent on bringing people to the Lord, on serving God. I, I, I've just spent, I, I, I mean, I've never known anybody that laying on their deathbed and said, I've just I just spent too much time investing in my family or building up my friends or serving other people or sharing the gospel or getting to know God. I, I should have spent more time at the mall. Anybody ever say that? No, you, you never hear that, do you? And that's never the case. And, and Jesus is teaching us that. He, he's teaching us, listen, You want to find satisfaction, give your life for other people. And then it gets to the last part of this passage. And it's it's the most important part. It's the most powerful part. It's the powerful conclusion. He's got the disciples there. and And he has this conversation with the disciples. And this is what he says. In this climactic conclusion, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, don't don't you have a saying? Don't you say four months more and then the harvest? I mean, that's what Jesus said to, to his disciples. He says, hey, hey, don't you guys have a saying? Hey, four months more and then we'll have a harvest. And, and if you're the disciples there, you're all standing, you've already had your confusing dinner. You know, he had lunch, and we didn't know he had lunch. You've already had that moment. But Jesus says, hey, don't, don't, y'all, don't y'all have a saying around here? Four more months, and then the harvest, and the disciples are all nodding their head. Like, yeah, we do say that. We say that. Now, now you, you've got to understand. You've got to understand how their life worked. See, Jesus, Jesus was saying, like you take barley, for instance. They would plant barley, and, and what he was saying is, you plant barley in the ground, and you wait four months, and in four more months, you have barley pops up. It sprouts up. You've got, you've got a harvest of barley, right? I mean, that's what, that's what Jesus was saying. And, and, and they lived by this Jewish calendar. You, you need to understand this about that day, because they understood this. When Jesus was talking about this, it just clicked in their mind. They lived by this Jewish calendar, and, and, and it was sort of their, their religious observations. They had this holy schedule, and their devotion to God revolved around this holy schedule. They had the Passover. And then about 40 days later, seven weeks or so later, they had Pentecost. 
And then a, a little while later, they had the Feast of the Tabernacles. And, and in these, these times, these, these holy days, on these holy days, God met with them and God blessed them. And here's what you need to understand. These holy days were tied to the harvest. See, the, the Passover was tied to the barley harvest. And, and the, the Pentecost, Pentecost was tied to the wheat harvest. And the Feast of the Tabernacles was, was tied to the grape harvest. And, and so when Jesus was saying, hey, don't you say four months later and then the harvest? When he said harvest, they knew not only is there a harvest, there's a holy day attached to it. Four more months, and it's going to be the harvest. And when the harvest comes, we got Passover. And at Passover, you meet with God. You engage with God. God, God comes, and God blesses you there. And, and you've got this experience with God. And then you wait 40 more days. And in 40 more days, it's Pentecost, and it's the wheat harvest. There's a harvest there. And Jesus says, listen, don't you say four more months? And then comes the harvest. And then he said this, listen. He said, look. Lift up your eyes. Look. I tell you that the harvest is now. And most scholars think that at that, that point, Jesus is pointing to this, this woman that he had this conversation with at the well. And this crowd of people that she had gathered up, it was coming back to meet with him. And he's saying to the disciples, Harvest is now. What's he speaking to? This, this language makes so much more sense in their day, but I, I want you to get it. What, what's he speaking to? He's saying, hey, don't y'all say that the harvest will come? And, and, and when the harvest comes, we have this time with God. We meet with God. God blesses us. It's awesome. It's incredible. He said, but I'm telling you, no more lag time. No more someday. Someday we'll have the harvest. Someday we'll have a harvest. And when the harvest comes, we can be made right with God. That'll be great. When the harvest comes, we'll have Passover. And, and when we have Passover, God does something miraculous. And, and then when the next harvest comes, we'll have Pentecost. And when we have Pentecost, that, that's a day to be with God. And then when the next harvest comes, we'll have the Feast of the Tabernacles and we'll get to experience God's blessing. And Jesus said, no, no more someday. So the harvest is now. He, he, Jesus was saying, listen, I'm the fulfillment. I am your Passover. I am your Pentecost. I am your Feast of the Tabernacle. Right now is the time. Now is the day. To experience me. You don't have to wait four months to be right with me anymore. Because now's the time. He's saying no more someday living. You don't have to wait for Easter or Christmas. Now's the time. I'm here right now. Now is the moment. You don't have to wait till you, till you start reading your Bible again. Or till, hey, when I, when I get to praying right, you know, when I, when I learn how to really pray, then I'll experience God. Or when I get, when, when I start trying a little harder then I can be right with God. When I get back in my community group, I'll be right with God. No, he's saying right now is the time. There's no more waiting. There's no more hoping for the harvest or hoping for the holy day because now's the day. He's saying you can experience me right now. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that great? Y'all don't seem to be as excited about that as I am. Isn't that awesome? He was saying, no more, no more someday, hoping God will make it right. You can be made right right now, today. Today. I think for some of you here today, Jesus would say, I know everything there is to know about you. I know everything there is to know about you. And I still love you. I still accept you. And I want you to know that now's the time. Would you just bow your heads? You know, my guess is there's somebody here today that you're amazed at the truth 
You're just amazed at the truth that Jesus knows everything there is to know about you and that he still loves you. Maybe you've thought for a long time, hey, someday will be my time. Someday will be the day that I want to get right with God. Someday will be the day that, that I lose the addiction. Someday will be the day that I, you know, that I start seeking after God. Someday will be the day that I, that I forgive or that I'm forgiven. Someday will be that day. And today, maybe you're just recognizing, maybe the Holy Spirit is pressing in on your heart right now to say, today is the day. Now I want to just ask you to do something if that's the case. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything, you know, anything that would embarrass you or that would be crazy. All I'm going to ask you is, if that's the case, in just a minute, would you just look up here at me? Just keep your head bowed and your eyes closed if that's not you. But if you would say, and hey, I, I know that I've been searching for something that I haven't found. And I recognize today what I need is to embrace this Jesus who knows everything about me and still loves me, who knows everything I've ever done and still loves me and accepts me. And I recognize today is the day. All I'm going to ask you to do is just look up here at me so I can pray for you. If that's you and you would say, I know today's the day, would you just look up here at me and make eye contact? Thank you. Awesome. Somebody else. If you'd say, today's, I recognize. That's awesome. You looking at me? Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. Somebody else. Thank you. Awesome. You would say, I, I know that I need to be loved by somebody who knows everything I've ever done and yet loves me still. Just make eye contact with me. It's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. God, I just pray for these people in this room this morning. I pray that today would be a life-changing day. We don't have to wait for someday at, at 11.07 on a Sunday morning. Because of Jesus, because he's present, because that's what kind of God he is, that you're present, that you're available, that you're here, that you're now. I pray that these people that have made eye contact me, with me would find what they're looking for that there would be something powerful that would take place in their lives, just like it did this lady 2,000 years ago at this well. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and we're going to dismiss in just a moment. We're going to sing one more song, and I would just encourage you not to leave. And then we're going to dismiss, and I want to ask those of you that looked at me to do something. It, it, it not, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to make it difficult. It's just on your C-Link. There's a little box there that says, I'd like to talk to somebody about a spiritual decision. Whether you looked at me or not, if, if you know that you need to follow up with somebody and talk about what a next step might look like, I would just ask you, you listen, this is way too important. It's way too important to walk out of here without taking a next step. You can just check, check that box. I'd like to talk to somebody about a spiritual decision. Put your name and contact information on there. And somebody will give you a call and just see if we can, we can help you figure that out. God, give us all the courage and the grace to embrace you right now. Not waiting for any other time to embrace you now. And I pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing.